Coming up next, Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. I want to define very specifically what total commitment looks like. We are not leading up to some emotional moment. We're leading up to a wise decision where you're going to weigh the risk and the logic of saying to God in a few minutes, I surrender all to you. I would sign a blank check made out to you. I would say to you, from this day forward, I'm all in. I may be a little fearful, but I'm all in. But in order to do that, you know, what, what's that look like? The answer is in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and after 11 chapters of treasure, of what God has done, of how much he loves you, of his sovereignty, his goodness, his forgiveness, his power, his spirit living within you, his gifts, all the plans that he has for you. In chapter 12, your response to that is, therefore, I urge you, brothers, sisters, fellow family members, the apostle Paul writes, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Notice the structure. There's a command, there's a motivation, and there's a reason. I'd like you, if you will, put a box around the word offer, put a box around living sacrifice, and then put a little box around the word holy. And then I want you to put a squiggly line under spiritual act of worship. The command is to offer your body to God. And, and this isn't metaphorical. This is like your physical body, your eyes, your head, your hands, all that you are. And the word offer here is in a tense in the Greek language that's punctiliar. And what that means is on a certain day at a certain time. This passage is not explaining how to have your sins forgiven. This passage is not explaining what it means to be uh, in God's family. Salvation occurs at the end of chapter 3, 4, and right in chapter 5, the work of Christ by grace. You receive the free gift by faith. Chapter 12 is saying, how do normal Christians follow Jesus out of gratitude? And God says, are you ready? This is what I want. I want you on a certain day at a certain time to say to me, all I am, all I have is yours. That's what it means to offer. I will tell you that just from our experience in teaching this series about three times in the last six years, tens of thousands of people in America and around the world do not understand the channel through which God's best and biggest blessings flow. The average Christian somehow thinks, I've received Jesus, he's my savior, it's really real, I read the Bible some, I'm really trying hard to be a good Christian, but it's not going that well. The power for the Christian life comes in this moment of offering, where, remember how your that garden hose when you're having the water battle gets crinked? The way to uncrink it is when you say, it's the channel, it's the conduit, Lord, now, it requires faith. It requires believing in an invisible treasure that you can't see, but it's a historical living God who's walked upon the earth and died in your place and rose and sits at the right hand of God and says to you, there's an unspeakable treasure who for joy says to you, let me give you the best. My first two and a half years as a Christian, I, I didn't know. I got to wear... I was pretty undisciplined, so I'd never read the Bible. I trusted Christ the summer after my high school senior year. I went off to college, and it took me three or four or five, six months to get where I could read the Bible maybe three or four times a week. And, but, but God spoke to me. It was exciting. And then I, I went to a little Bible study, and, and there was God's presence and loving people, and, and there was part of it. It was just amazing. And, but then, you know, I wanted the basketball team to like me, and there were all these girls and... 
So yay for God, chip, God, chip. And you know, Thursday night, oh, I've experienced God's presence. And Friday and Saturday night, you know, wee hours of the morning, God, I'm sorry, I'll never do that. I was a schizophrenic, had all these hidden things in my life. And the joy of my salvation was creeping, creeping down as I had sort of this salad bar spirituality, you know? God on my terms, I obey 8.5 of the commands. 85%, doesn't that pass? <laughs> no, Chip. And I remember going to a conference where what I just shared was taught. It was a life of Abraham. And, and the man, it was just 30 or 40 people in a little room at a conference, and he, he walked us through God's school of faith, and he got to chapter 22, where God says to his son, his only son, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and take him on this mountain and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham gets up early. He's been with God over, he's, he's 100 years old now. And we learn later that he, he's learned that when God says something, you can bank on it. And although it seems so illogical, so irrational, he did it. And he got the knife up, and he was ready to come down, and God said, stop. Now I know that you are loyal to me because you gave your son, your only son, whom you love. And prior to that time, God had made some promises to Abraham about his descendants and about the future that were about this big. And after that moment of surrender, read in chapter 22, God expands, 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 says, no, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do now. Because Abraham, I never wanted your boy. I would never want to sacrifice. What I wanted was your heart. And that boy became an idol. And anytime there's anything in front of God's relationship with you, and you have an idol, you will destroy the idol. The idol will destroy you, and that will destroy your relationship with God. And those are the beads. Those are the plastic pearls, and they can be work, and they can be family, they can be a relationship, it can be money, it can be ego, it can be your body. All of us have Isaacs. And unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears forth much fruit. That's Jesus. So I need to take my idols. In my case, it was basketball and my girlfriend. And it was like, God, I'll do whatever you want. Don't mess with basketball and don't mess with my girlfriend. And at the back of that little... 30 or 40 people, I remember I made the most transformational decision of my life apart from receiving Christ as my Savior. And with fear and trembling, I got on my knees and I said, God, I am scared to death because I'm afraid that you're going to either make me single the rest of my life or worse, I'll marry some ugly person. I'm, I'm just telling you, okay? Like I'm 20 year old, what do I know? And then I said, and, and God, you know, I've just been playing hoop my whole life, and just when I get the ball in the middle on the break, I just love this game. And, but if you, you're God. I mean, please don't take that away, but, but it's an idol. And I want you to know that I'm, I'm all in. I don't know what it looks like, but I will do life, and I'm sure I'll mess up later, but I will do life your way moving forward. Whatever your word says, if it says it, I'm making a pre-decision. I may mess up, but I'm going to come back to this moment. I surrender my heart, my goals, my future, my money, my dreams. I want to do life your way. That's what it means to offer your body. And then notice it's not just one big emotional experience. What's the next box? It's living sacrifice, right? Many of you in this room will make that step today. Many in this room have already taken that step. But, but it's, it's you offer your body how, as a living sacrifice. So the living sacrifice, you know, is a lot like marriage. You know, in 1978, I said to Teresa, I surrender to you. Nobody else but you. And she said, I surrender to you. And we said, let's do this together forever no matter what. But I've had to renew that commitment almost every day. And there's times we needed marriage counseling. We've had hard times with some of our kids. And we've had health issues and we've had cancer. And we've had all kinds of problems. But no matter what, because we said, boom, we commit to one another no matter what. It was that commitment that's kept us together. And it's been the channel of God's biggest and best blessings. 
Now I got 33 years. I not only got married, I got a great wife. I got a loyal wife. I got the best friend I've ever had. I've got a, a relationship I never saw in my family growing up. I never dreamed. Has it been easy? No. It's been great. And then God, what's he do? He's got such a sense of humor. <laughs> I give away basketball, and, you know, it took me a while. So, you know, I, I pulled uh, my quad completely out, missed most of that year. Uh, then I got injured again, and then they changed coaches, and finally it was, okay, I'm going to, by my senior year, I'll do it your way. Surrender. And God turns around after I graduated, and I played in every country in South America, and I was just a little NAIA. You know, that's like Division Three little school. And then once I surrendered, God said, you know, um, he got me on this team, and I'm playing against Olympic teams all over South America and later with an Australian team throughout all the Orient. See, the issue is not he wants to take something good away. The issue is any good thing that stands between you and him that's an idol will destroy your relationship with him. And by the way, it'll destroy your relationship with the idol. So it's a living sacrifice. You make the commitment, but then it's daily renewing and living. And it's holy. That's the last word. It's holy. You, you, you can't come and not deal with your stuff. There's some of you, you're, you're sitting here at this moment, you're thinking, if I surrender, this relationship with this rotten guy or this girl that I know isn't God's will, but I sure love her, God would say, you know it's not right. For some of you, you're realizing, we probably, living together is not an option if I surrender. For others of you, you're going, oh my gosh, you know, my priorities are so out of whack, I'm a workaholic, or my finances are a mess. See, it's holy. No blemish sheep. He's just saying, you come as you are, but there's this commitment to say, God, I, I'm not playing games. I'm going to do life your way. And then I'm going to bring all of me. And that's not only the good stuff, but you're going to come and say, I'm bringing my fears of rejection. I'm bringing my fears of the future. I'm bringing my fears of what you might do. I trust that you're a good God. In fact, notice the motivation. The motivation is not get with the program. It's the mercy of God. The mercy of God. He, he's looking back on the last 11 chapters, but he's saying, God's asking for all of you, but what's he done? He's loved you. He's forgiven you. He's paid for your sin. He's caused the spirit to come into your body. He's taken you from the kingdom of darkness and put you in the kingdom of light. He's adopted you as a daughter or as a son. He has a purpose for your life. He's creating a place at this very moment in heaven for you. He's laid down his life. He says, can't you trust me? This, you know, this is like someone who's, who you've given a million dollars and they come to you and they say, hey, um, you, uh, you think I could borrow 20 bucks? He goes, I don't know. I don't know if you pay it back. And you go, what do you mean? I don't know if you pay it back. I gave you a million dollars. Yeah, well, I don't know. See, that's, you start to get the kingdom logic. How could you not to a God who has demonstrated why you were his enemy and I was his enemy, laid down his life. How can we not believe that he's good, that he's compassionate, that he's kind? See, this is not a get with the program, be a superstar or a Christian Marine. This is a let your father love you. Let's remove the barriers. And the final reason is your spiritual act of worship. In other words, what God really wants. I mean, we started out with a question that leads to a decision. The question is, how do you give God what he wants the most? Are you ready for this? It gets real simple. God wants you, all of you, every aspect of you. See, you can read the Bible, you can pray, you can come to church, you can give some money, you can go on a missions trip, you can try and be a good moral person, you can do all kinds of things. There was a group in the New Testament that did all that and more, and Jesus said the harshest things that ever came out of his mouth about those religious people, because their hearts weren't his. They were in control, and they used their religion, and they thought they were better than other people. They weren't tender, they weren't broken, they weren't loving. 
Left to ourselves, we are a people who will create some little grid or model about how we're okay with God because we're doing this, 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 and this as we gain and keep control. And your control always is shown by where your money goes, where your time goes, where your energy goes, and what you dream about. And when he has your heart in those areas, I'll tell you what, those things get transformed. And then, then are you ready? You discover why you're here. You discover what your purpose is. You discover there, there really is more to life than setting goals and accomplishing them. You experience the treasure both now and the promise forever. He wants you. As you turn to the back page, I wanted to just give you two pictures that have been very helpful to me. One is a, a blank check. And you'll notice that all of you got one of these. And, and this blank check, for many of you, this will be the first time. And, and I want to tell you, this, please do not hear. Everything will be easy and wonderful and great. In fact, many of you will be tested. Abraham didn't take a rubber knife up there. It may get worse before it gets better. But long before Dr. Phil, the Holy Spirit would say, well, how's it working for you your way? And today, pay to the order of Jesus Christ, and there's a date, and you'll write today's date. And then you'll sign your name. And there'll be a sense of fear in your heart, but it'll be a step of faith. And you'll say, I'm all in, God. You can cash this. You can cash this with my future. You cash this with my relationships. You cash this with my finances. You cash with my career. You cash it with my geography. I will do whatever you want me to do. I believe you're that good and that kind. And I actually believe that you could pick out what's better for me than I could pick out for me. Do you see how arrogant it is when we say to God, oh, I, I want your forgiveness and your salvation, but I'll run my life because I'm way smarter than you. I mean, you created the universe, but look at me. So I really want you to think risk, reason, the decision-making process. What it means to fill out the check, I came across a, a small excerpt of a, of a prayer by a lady named Ruth Myers. And just, just lean back. You can even shut your eyes. When you think about what it means for you to sign this check in just a moment, think of a prayer that might go something like this. Lord, I'm yours. Whatever the cost may be, your will be done in my life. I realize that I'm not on earth to do my own thing or to seek my own fulfillment or my own glory. I'm not here to indulge my desires or increase my possessions or to impress people, to be popular or to prove I'm somebody important or to promote myself. I'm not even here to be relevant and successful by human standards. I am here on this earth to please you. And so now I offer myself to you for you are worthy. All that I am or hope to be, I owe to you. I am yours by creation and I am yours by the purchase price of your son on the cross that paid for my sin. And so right now I give you my body and each of its members, my entire inner being. I give you my mind, my emotional life, my will, my loved ones, my marriage or my hope for marriage. I give you right now my abilities and my gifts, my strengths and my weaknesses, my health and my status, whether it be high or low. I give you my possessions, my past, my present, and my future. And I even give you when you want to bring me home to be with you. I'm here to love you and to obey you and to glorify you. You ready to take that step? It'll be the greatest decision you ever, ever make. And for some of you that are a little bored, if you play lots of video games, watch a lot of TV, have to go to a lot of movies, find yourself shopping or eating a lot, you know what those are? That's symptoms of a life of boredom. That's a symptom of nothing of genuine purpose and focus. That's a symptom of medicating yourself with plastic pearl beads. 
And I, I had a little struggle growing up uh, long before I was a Christian. I like adventure, I like excitement, I like risk. And so someone early introduced me to cards. So I played cards Friday night, gambled. And then I was fascinated with horse racing. So by my senior year, Tuesday and Friday nights, I played the horses. And I just can't tell you the thrill that it is to put down $2 your very first bet and win a $103 Quinella. I thought, what an easy way to make money. And so that sent me on a journey where I found myself about a year and a half later, literally in the boys' bathroom. Um, I put my feet up on the commode so they couldn't see me. And when the three linemen on the football team that I owed a few hundred dollars to were coming to collect in a very inappropriate way to my body, I decided to quit gambling. I wasn't a Christian, wasn't anything spiritual to it. It was like, this is nuts. And I got a problem. But I have to tell you, when I turn on the old TV and the world poker Texas Hold'em is on, I just have to check it out. <laughs> and here's what I love, because there's a great principle. You know, it's the final table. They got all these stacks, millions of dollars. The pot's worth, you know, $14.7 million. Two low hole cards, those. Risk, mmm, these are good cards. Reason, evaluating everything I've seen this guy do in response. Action, faith. You could probably finish it with me, right? I'm all in. And then what happens? Electricity happens. The game completely changes. Then he steps up. He starts walking around. <laughs> oh, why? Here's why. Because something's going to happen. There's no reward until you get to the point where you say, I'm all in. He's either going to get a bracelet and multiple millions of dollars, or he's going to lose. And I want to tell you that the God of the universe brought you in this room on this day for you to say to him, I'm all in. And when you do, you will begin to experience power and excitement and challenge and purpose like you've never known. Because just like in Texas Hold'em, the game never really gets interesting until you're all in. And my, my sad observation is the great majority of Christians that I know are just trying to be nice people, trying to get a little bit better mobility for their family, trying to figure out how to balance all the demands, be a little bit more polite than most people, read their Bible now and then and come to church and put a little salve on the guilt of your soul. And your heavenly father, I think with tears in his eyes, say, why won't you taste the treasure? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But those that come must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 